Okay, uh, thank you everybody for joining us for uh, another session of, of, of uh, WADE. It's a pleasure today to have with us Ramban, who's visiting from uh, Technion slash Potsdam in Germany, uh, who will be talking about the um, dry tin martini problem for Sturmian Hamiltonians, though I don't think there are actually any martinis for the audience today. We don't know yet. We'll see. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks, James, Hugo, Pedro, for all that invitation. And I hope uh, the people at home, do you hear me well? They hear me? Probably. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> Just technically not at home. <laughs> what do you see here? What is this? You know, it's like a Rorschach test. Like you, can, you have a certain <laughs> image, and then what do you see here? Yeah, I can tell you what I see here. I see a butterfly. And I will try throughout the talk to explain you why do I see a butterfly. Uh, this picture kind of uh, encapsulates the nature of our project, uh, which is a very enjoyable project with two great colleagues, Siegfried Beckus from Potsdam and Rafi Levy from the Technion. And let me start with a story. Um, I think now it's time yeah, to get started. Ah, okay. So uh, the story, uh, I hope this will not interrupt too much, but it's not good. The story starts with young Douglas Hochstarter. Uh, so he was a PhD student, uh, eventually in physics, even though he also tried to study mathematics at some point. And uh, as part of uh, <laughs> as part of his uh, excursions and his uh, PhD project, he got from his supervisor uh, the mission to study this operator. So what is it? H alpha beta theta? It's an operator from functions L two Z to L two Z. How it is defined? Uh, so when it acts on a function on Z, it returns the sum of neighbors. This is called the adjacency operators many times, plus a potential, this is called potential or diagonal operator, uh, which is given in the following sense. So you have here a sequence, omega alpha theta. Omega alpha theta is twice cosine, and then you have the frequency alpha that determines the, the potential and some initial end of theta. Uh, so this is the sequence determining the potential, and it is multiplied by some coupling coefficient b. That's the operator. His supervisor told him, start studying the operator the spectral analysis in terms of the spectrum. Uh, which he did, and during his PhD, which uh, was carried in the US, he went with his supervisor to Germany, to meet two uh, professor colleagues, and then they were all like the three professors and the young Douglas Hofstadter sitting in a room doing very hard analysis. At some point, uh, Douglas Hofstadter was kind of a bit bored and overwhelmed with all the everything that happened in the room, and he went outside of the room to the corridor, and then in the corridor he saw this machine. Later, a friend of Douglas called it Rumpelstiltschen, and then he got very excited. Uh, because as a teenager, he was using this kind of machine to do uh, numerics, to program various things. So he said, ah, wait, maybe I'll, I'll try to use this machine. It will just lie in the corridor now and use it. So maybe I'll just get hold of it, and I'll try to program something that reveals the spectrum of this operator, which he did. Now, these days, doing numerics is, uh, I wouldn't say it's, it's uh, it's really easy, but, but compared to, to the task that he had, it's relatively easy these days because this, this machine didn't even have a, a, a monitor. It just, so you, you put some things and then you get some out, output, some numbers, and if you want to have a plot, it's not just you use MATLAB or Python and get the plot, but, but you really take the numbers and start plotting them with your hand, which he did, and that's the picture that he got. So what do you see in this picture? For different values of alpha, the frequency, he took, he chose them different, he chose different values of alpha, and then he computed the spectrum of this operator for particular alphas and plotted it. So, so for various alphas, say alpha one half, 
he found that the spectrum is just this blue interval, and he plot the bit. Alpha one third, you have three intervals, you plot it, and so on and so forth. And he got this picture, he stared at the picture, and he got excited. So he said, well, there is some very nice internal structure within the picture. Uh, so he ran, he ran back uh, to the room to his uh, supervisor, telling him, look, look, look what I have here. But the supervisor didn't believe a word of what I was saying. Even when he was looking straight at the hand and plot in my notebook, he had nothing but words of disdain for my empirical claim. I told him that this graph consists of infinitely many tiny copies of itself, fractal like, uh, but the supervisor told him, this isn't physics, you're merely doing numerologies. And even, I'm sorry to say that you won't be ever get a PhD uh, thesis for your work on this problem, that. Uh, but somehow Douglas, or fortunately Douglas Hofstadter was quite persistent. And uh, he knew in his bones that what Ram Constitution and, and I had uh, empirically discovered together was correct, and he continued. And even when he went to the, back to the United States, he continued uh, computing spectrum. Then he went back to a bit more, slightly more sophisticated machine. So he managed to improve his plot and get this plot that nowadays is relatively popular. Uh, and you can find it if you Google Hofstadter's butterfly, so it reminds the butterfly to, to some people. And again, the spirit of the, of the figure is the same for various alpha, you compute the spectrum and you get this picture, just you made it for many more alphas. Yeah. What happens to the D? So, it's, uh, so you fix, you fix some, you, you, good question, yeah, thanks. So you fix some value of V and some value of theta, and, and for that you make the plot. So, so for different values of V, uh, you can make different you can make different pictures. I suspect that here V equals one because V equals one is a very special case. It's called the critical case. I'm not going a bit into the theory, but so, so I think it's that usually the one that is drawn, but you can you can really draw it for people. Yeah, thanks. Right. So then he got even more excited. He ran again to his supervisor and showed him this picture. And uh, he hoped that when he showed this new computer plot, uh, the fog would start to lift. But in order really to convince the supervisor, he had to magnify uh, these regions in an undistorted and greatly magnified way. And then it was obvious that you have here some copies, like the, the big butterfly is being reflected here in smaller and smaller mm -hmm. butterfly. So only at this point, the scales at last uh, truly fell from Gregory's eyes. And from being my highly acerbic critic, Gregory soon metamorphosed into my most stalwart champion. So he got, he got some recognition from his supervisor and also actually gradually from the, from the bigger mathematical community. This is a very nice story that Douglas Hofstadter wrote and it appears in the beginning of a very nice book that is called Butterfly in the Quantum World uh, from, by Satya. Uh, about Hofstadter, about the flying so I think it's a nice, uh, nice reading of, of the story and also of the book. Uh, so then when the recognition came, uh, I'll go a bit forward in time, so this was like in 76 was the discovery, and then in 1981, Marcus gave a colloquium talk in the AMS meeting, and he phrased a problem around Mark, uh, around uh, Hofstadter's butterfly, uh, the problem, I'll, I'll say it now very briefly, and later I will give some more details. So to show that uh, for alphas that are irrational, the spectrum is a Cantor set, or actually a generalized Cantor set, not just the classical one with the one third, but a generalized Cantor set, which, which exposes some of the fractal nature of the spectrum. And Marcat said that he will give 10 martinis to whoever moves. Uh, then Barry Simon, a year later, he wrote a very nice review paper. At the end of the review paper, he posed quite a few open problems. And then he said uh, that this problem of Marcus is called the 10 Martini problem. And so then the name comes. Barry Simon likes to give names, if you know. Uh, and actually, being honest, uh, so already the fractal nature of the spectrum appeared in the, in the earlier paper. Uh, by Mark Asberg. I mean, even Hofstadter said that he got some inspiration from, from this paper. 
And then people started working on this problem, like showing that for irrational alpha, this is the kind of cell. So really the series of works, I will not go through them just, just to give you some uh, feeling, but I'll immediately jump to the to the final answer, which was given by uh, Svetlana Zhitomirska and Arthur Ravila, 2005, they solved the Tenmarkini problem. And I will later say exactly what does it mean to solve the Tenmarkini problem. So that's the solution. Uh, and this is again the butterfly with the operator, as you see here, and the, the, the potential. Uh, this operator, by the way, is called the almost mighty operator, if you have the name. But now I will, I will jump into the operator that I want to consider in my talk. It's very similar to this operator. We just change the potential. And it goes like that. I will now tell you which potential omega we are taking. Uh, so we are taking the following potential omegas. Uh, here you have a characteristic function with the size alpha, so you can also plot it on the unit, on the unit uh, uh, circle or a circle with unit in the circumference. So you have a, you have an alpha size angle, and then you jump, as you see here in the animation, of you jump in jumps of size alpha, and whenever you hit the the window. You, you put one, whenever you hit outside, you put zero. So this sequence omega is just a sequence of zeros and ones. But you have the same parameters, alpha and theta, the angle, and it is being multiplied by the, the coupling function. So this sequence is called Sturmian sequence, and the operator is called the Sturmian uh, Hamiltonian or Sturmian operator. And here we can also plot a butterfly of our operator. So exactly in the same manner for every alpha, we plot the spectrum, and then we get this butterfly. This was done by a very clever student from the Technion, Barak Bitter. And it's also a good point to get questions from the audience at home or here, if you have any. <clears throat> Is there a counterpart to this for a continuous problem? You mean, you mean of this? Of the, of, well, of the operator. Uh, I mean, yeah. so is there a counterpart to something like this? You have a Schrodinger on the line or something like that? Yeah, so there is a, a one immediate thing that I can say is that there is there is the work of uh, uh, David Gamanik, uh, Jake Filman, and Anton Gorodetsky that they took they took this operator and they considered it on R, on the real line. Instead of this, they took the Laplacian, the second derivative of R. And instead of the potential, what they did is they took uh, two, kinds of, uh, two kinds of bumps. So say you, you take two, take some bump, and I don't know, maybe something. Okay. Maybe a little to the right. Sure. A little to the right, yeah. So you take. Right, and then shall I try to don't touch. don't touch? Okay. <laughs> so you take you take these two bumps and you say say this corresponds to zero, this corresponds to one, and now your potential, your your omega potential, you can build it by concatenating z according to the sequence of zeros and ones, you concatenate these pieces and you get continuous potential. So they did this work and they analyzed various properties of that operator. Uh, and, and, and quite a few things go very similarly to the analysis of this. Yeah, so this is one immediate continuous model. One can think maybe there are other angles, but this is something, yeah. Where does the problem come from on that original? Uh, it, it looks like it's sticking an average as operator, right? But an average around the point fix. Well, but they had one point behind them and some sort of you you mean this? Yeah. Where was the original operator that Hosh started the study? Right, right. Okay, that, that's that's also a very good question. So uh, uh, so this is the one dimensional Laplacian that has a meaning of average, like you said. Uh, so the almost mighty operator is actually coming from a two-dimensional version, a two-dimensional version on uh, on Z2. So on Z2 you can consider we can consider a lattice. Okay, it's a very good question, specifically because I told you that that Hochstetter came from physics. Yeah, this is so what I was thinking. You should probably connect it to something that was very involved. Yeah, very good question. 
So, so you take Z2, okay? And then you put a, let's say this magnetic flux in each such square. And the size of magnetic flux is alpha. So alpha is doing between zero and two pi. I mean, you can, you can do it with magnetic potential, but then when you integrate over, over, over such square, you get magnetic flux. So you, can, so you want to study shred, so if we study, it's called, so it's called the Halter's Halter equation. And if you study a uh, spectral uh, analysis of this equation on Z2, which, what is the physical meaning? It's, a, right, it's an electron, so it's an electron with a magnetic field, but this case model, an electron magnetic field, then the reduction of this half equation in 2D is the almost multi operator. And very nicely, this alpha, which is the magnetic flux, is this alpha, uh, is this uh, frequency alpha. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of the source of the, the motivation to do the almost. And when you say that uh, Turado has solved the problem, what what the solving the problem? I, I, so in the next crazy. slide, in the next slide, they make everything exact. I just want to first to to amuse you with the story to get your attention, and then I will go a bit more deeply to the specific details. Very good. Yeah. Thanks. Well, oh, so so one one thing to simplify a bit the model is one can uh, can observe that actually this theta you don't really need to care about these thetas if alpha is irrational. So let's just, I think I need again the, mm -hmm. the mouse. You help with the mouse. X up. Yeah, okay. So, so we drop the theta. It's also one less parameter. The spectrum is invariant with theta. It doesn't, it doesn't care about the theta. Now, let's see. So we have these two butterflies on the left and on the right. And let's see what does it mean to solve the 10 Martini problem and to get 10 Martinis. So on the left, uh, uh, what Avila and Stomirsky have solved is that for any rational alpha and for any V different than zero, the spectrum is a campus, generalized campus. That is the statement. V equals zero. When V equals zero, you have no potential. You have just the adjacent uh, uh, operator. The spectrum is one interval between minus two and two. There is no sense when we different zero. So to solve it completely means for any rational and for any V different zero. So they, they solve it 2005. For the Sturmian Hamiltonian, so uh, Shuto showed that uh, there is a counter spectrum and of the big measure zero, even of the spectrum. For particular alpha, it's particular alpha, but it's very important alpha, which maybe reminds you something. A golden ratio minus one, right? and this is and this golden ratio minus one uh, makes the analysis a bit easier. This operator with the golden ratio is quite important. It's called the Fibonacci Hamiltonian. There is connection to Fibonacci. You can think about it. You can talk about it later. So so it was fully solved for any p different than zero, but only for this particular alpha by Shuto. And then in the work uh, a bit later, uh, 89, uh, Belisar Diochum Scopola to start, solved it completely. Completely means any uh, rational alpha, any bit from zero. Okay, so the problem is solved here, the problem is solved here. Ten Martini is taken by here, I think. So now what, why, what is the talk about? And in order to, what is still to be solved? In order to understand it, let's go back to Okay, this is great. The other one, yeah. does the, the, the cancer set also have measures here? The one on the left, right? No, not, no. Uh, not, not yet. It, it, depends, it depends on V. Okay. And here there is the case of V equals one, which is critical. V smaller than one, V larger than one is. And it depends on the value. Yeah. Uh, right, so let's go back to, to Barry Simon's review that he wrote in 82 after Mark Katz gave the talk. Again, like I told you, at the end of the review, he writes the problem. It's problem number one. He calls it 10 Martini problem. So again, for all V dependent zero, all irrational alpha, show counter spectrum. <laughs> That's the problem. And, and, sorry? Uh, yeah, so, so, so like Hugo, uh, Hugo mentioned, the names come because Mark has also 10 Martini, but it is not clear when, what we will give for partial <laughs> solutions, how many Martinis. <laughs> but actually, Barry Simon wrote the following also. Actually, Mark Katz didn't ask this question, but he asked a different question. He asked, 
whether the operator has all its gaps there. And then he phrases the second problem, which I will tell you, which I will tell you now what it is. Here it's still, it's not completely clear, but I will explain. So Mark Katz asked a different question, which Barry Simon calls the, the 10 martini problem, the strong form or the dry, dry form. That's why this problem number two is called the dry 10 martini problem. So being honest, what Mark Katz asked is the dry 10 martini problem, uh, but Barry Simon wanted two different problems in his review. So one of them is called the 10 martini, the other one is the dry 10 martini. And we are just left to understand, now what is the dry 10 martini in the next slide? In order to understand it, we need uh, just to understand what is integrated density of states. So the integrated density of states is the following. I demonstrate it for this operator. You take the operator, you restrict it to a finite box from one to n. So, so this is a finite matrix. And then for every energy E, you count how many eigenvalues this matrix has smaller than E. And you divide by the size of the matrix and you let the size of the matrix go to infinity. That's one definition of the integrated density of things. Okay. Now, how does it look like? It looks something like that. It's an increasing function, continuous. This we denote it as n or n alpha v because it depends on alpha and v. Uh, so as, as, a, as a function of energy, it looks something like that, monotone increasing and continuous. Also, Whenever you have a point not in the spectrum, then there is a neighborhood such that the IDS, the integrated density of states, is constant. So you see that it is constant in some regions, and these, these regions where it is constant are outside the spectrum. The blue part here is the spectrum. Uh, so it increases on the spectrum, constant outside the spectrum, out and outside the spectrum, what is outside the spectrum is called gap or spectral gap, and every spectral gap, you see, is bounded between two energies. So E prime and E. Now, this is kind of a caricature of the IDS, but even the caricature is not honest for our operator, because I draw here these intervals, but you know already, because of the 10 Martini problem, that our spectrum is not like that, it's Cantor set. So how would the IDS look for a Cantor set? For a counter set, you will get something like the devil's staircase function, right? Mm -hmm. It's a counter set, it has many, countably many gaps. And what people are interested in, in these constant gaps, what are the fun what are the values that the function attains at the gaps? And these are called the gap labels. The IDS, what does it get on the gap? It, it's called the gap label. People are interested in, in this. Why? So also, if you look for like for physical motivation, it's actually uh, related to the quantum hole effect, integer quantum hole effect, and these values of the gap labels gives the whole conductivity. If you heard about it, of the of the quantum hole effect, if, if you model it by in this sense. But 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 now I'll forget about the physics and just hope that you believe me that these these are interesting. And now for this, there is some theory that developed saying what are the values that the IDS can get at the gap labels. Uh, so the theory was mainly developed by Belisard with two authors, and it says this. So the value that the IDS gets at, at the gaps, at energies that are not in the spectrum, is among these candidates. These are the possible values. So you always, you always can get one, because at the end you get one for the integrated density of states. And the other values are related to the frequency alpha, integer multiples of alpha modulo one, because all of this is between zero and one. So these are all the candidates for what, what do you get at the gaps. That's the gap labeling theorem demonstrated for this operator. And actually this right hand side works for both operators. So for our Sturman Hamiltonian and for the almost Martin operator. That was then for the cosine, right? For the for the for the cos. So it's both for the cosine and for the characteristic function. For both, if you apply this uh, theory, for both you get the same. And now is the question of Mark Katz asking: Are all gaps there? Is asking whether this inclusion is equality. 
whether really all the candidates appear as gaps. All the, you can see all the gaps. Or if it's not, uh, if it's a strict inclusion, it means that some of the gaps kind of that can appear, you don't see them. So that's the question of Mark Katz. And that is nowadays placed as the dry ten martini problem. Let me just to explain you the problem. Okay. Now let's see what is known about the problem for both kinds of operators. Uh, so once again, this the the AMO uh, almost multi operator uh, with this potential is actually much more studied. The, the community is slightly is slightly bigger. Many works. I would just. I'll just say what's kind of the latest uh, uh, progress, which is an archive uh, a few months ago. Uh, and then, so uh, Avila, you and Jo proved, solved the dry 10 martini problem for all irrational alphas and for almost all V. So V different than zero always, but V also different than one. So for V equal, equals to one, uh, it, was, it is not provided. Uh, in the reference. Uh, and B equals to one, it's called the critical case. It's an interesting case, but that's kind of the latest progress. And now we will move, uh, again, much more to be said here, but I will move to our, our butterfly, our operator. Uh, so first there is a, a remarkable work by uh, Lauren Raymond, who solved the problem for all irrational alphas and assuming that the potential is large enough, V greater than four, and I will demonstrate uh, a bit later why intuitively uh, this is easier, this V for large V. Uh, then uh, the Manik and Gordeski proved it once again for the Fibonacci Hamiltonian golden ratio, for, but for small V values. Uh, then May May generalized it for uh, like small V values, but for other alphas. And then uh, lately uh, the Manik Gordeski in the SM completely proved it for the Fibonacci Hamiltonian. So for this particular alpha, they solved it for all values of V. And what they want to talk about next in a bit more details is, is our uh, theorem, so with uh, Victor Bekos and Rafi Levy, uh, where we solved it. So for every rational alpha and for every V different than zero, uh, we show that all the gaps are there. All the candidates appear, but for this operator, for the Stormer Hamilton. You cannot cover their case for the equals one. Uh, I would be happy to do it. <laughs> but does the picture change much when you change when you change V? Or does it call it on, on the left or well, right? both? I mean when you change V, uh, right? The, the, because at the end of the day you're still thinking that it's you know the kind of sets horizontally you know, when right, you right. the right. And uh, V and supposedly the pictures having been done for V equals one. And then suddenly V equals one becomes sort of yeah. critical and they can't really. Uh, the question is, does it change a lot? I mean, if you move V outside of V equals one a little bit up and down, right, right. So, does it so, change much? So, so I'll say a few words. So we mainly, it's easier for me to talk about how this looks when you change V because just we worked a lot about this. So when you change V, it's a bit like stretching the butterfly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stretching the butterfly. And if you will bear with me in a few slides, we'll, we'll even show it. That's V equal one. Your, That's your, V equal one also. Yeah. Agree, but yeah. moving a little bit up and down doesn't change qualitatively much the picture, right? Uh, you just stretch it a little. No, it does. It does. It does. And this is also related to increase V. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 but yeah. I'll show you. I'll show you. Okay. I'll show you in the slide. Here you will see. You bear with me and we give time. Yeah, yeah. Show you. Well, it's a good question. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and it's really part of this. You see, large V, small V, it was yeah. part of this effort and different different ways of attack. So, what kind of the Kind of techniques yes. are involved in the in this group. That's exactly that. That's that's well, the only thing that I'm going to talk about okay. from now until the end of the talk. What kind of techniques? What is the spirit of it? For, like, of, of but for all problems, these are common tools for. Uh, no, so or is so, the one on the left and on the right? So, uh, so our tools and these tools are somewhat common, mm -hmm. common, uh, but but different than those. Yes. Okay, yes, so uh, completely yeah, as far as I, again, I'm really not an expert about this, but it looks uh, different. There is some paper by physicists, a uh, very interesting one, that tries to connect the two butterflies. Mm -hmm. Still, but I cannot say a lot about it. Here. So let's dive a bit into the spirit of the proof, but it's not just the proof, you get some nice uh, ideas, I think, behind it. 
So first of all, let's glance like big glance of the proof, and then I will go into details. So the proof outline is kind of the following. You, we take this operator, so sigma is the spectrum of this operator, so alpha and beta, and we we approximate it using rational values of alpha. And then we get some spectral approximations. Then we somehow encode this rational alpha spectrum using a graph or an infinite tree graph, and even consider the boundary of this infinite tree graph. Then we manage to express the value of the integrated density of states using this tree graph. We manage to identify spectral gaps using two infinite paths on the graph. And to show that the whole gap, gaps are there. Did you uh, understand something? No, not at all, right? It's not completely clear, but, but you get some whole picture, right? Of the, you, have some picture, <laughs> you have some graph and something. And now let's go a bit into the details and I'll show you what is the graph, what are the approximation, just, just to give you the big picture. So let's go into the details. Alpha, you can write any number as continued fraction expansion, like that. If alpha is irrational, it will be infinite, but we can cut it so after k steps, and then we get a rational value of alpha, which we call alpha k. So alpha k is cutting after k steps. Now, if we put this alpha k inside the sequence, if, you, if we jump with rational angle, then this uh, series is periodic. If this and the period is actually the, uh, this, the denominator of, of the rational angle. And if we take a periodic uh, a potential, you know, I can do block block K, you do the analysis, you get that the spectrum of periodic one can see is absolutely continuous. And it consists, particularly in our case, of QK intervals. QK is the period, QK intervals, or it is many times being called spectral bands. So let's plot it. Let's shoot a few alpha Ks. So I'm cutting after K minus one steps, after K steps, after K plus one step, you get two intervals, four, more intervals. So this kind of hierarchy of the spectrum. Now, if you look on these spectral bands uh, long enough, you can observe, uh, uh, so before looking on them long enough, something that, that I will just tell you, maybe you believe me without looking on them long enough, is that we have this uh, a limit uh, process that if you take the spectra of two adjacent levels, the k level and the k plus one level, you take the union of this spectra, so say of that and of that, you will take a limit as k going to infinity. This is the same as taking the union and taking intersection of all these unions. And this is the same, ah, so, so you, <laughs> I mean, you can see it, but that's all. Yes, it's a nice, yeah. nice so, word. So you can you get the spectrum that you want. This is the spectrum of the irrational alpha. So the spectrum of the irrational alpha is obtained by taking intersection of all of this union, this union, this union, and so on. So really, if you if you know something about the about the rational approximants, you can hope to get something about the irrational. Alpha. Yeah. But so is it true that if you just take the limit of the spectrum of H alpha K V without the other one? No, that is not the no, no. No. Yeah. So it's not the, it's no. not the right limit. No, you need to take the unit. You need to consecutive yeah. ones, right? They're all they're yeah. all they're all chaining each other, right? They're all containing each yeah. other. That's why you yeah. take the a little right. bit the same as intersection. Yeah. But you yeah. cannot just take one of them. No, no, you need to take two. I'll, maybe the next thing I will show give will might give some intuition of why two are. Uh, let's try to develop intuition why two why two is needed. Are these and the two lines that you show? Sorry. Are uh, the two lines? Or... No, but it is related. Okay. <laughs> related. So. Uh, here's another question. If you took any of the sequence of rationals converging to the irrational, would it still work? Or it only works with the so, sequence chosen this way? Uh, I think... Uh, right, because I'm you get the same not... phenomenon somehow for any rational choice, right? And then you pick any sequence, so I'd say... You know, an increasing sequence. Let's let's not make it too crazy. An increasing sequence converging to your irrational. Yeah. Would, would you still get the same thing by taking two consecutive points and taking the one? 
or does it have to be this? Uh, I'm not completely confident on my answer. I, I would say not always. Maybe you might get away with finding other rationals that will give you the limit, but, but not, not yet. all of them. Um, but but the next thing that I will show is that definitely depends on this on this cutting. Yeah. Uh, the limit you might still get away by using other rational approximation. Yes. Yeah. So so this appears this actually appeared already in the work of uh, that I mentioned before of, uh, from eighty nine. This this result. The next one now to stare enough about it on the on the spectral base. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. You, yeah, you, you, can, you can see that there is some kind of monotonicity property, namely every spectral band here in the K plus one is included either in some spectral band here or in some spectral band here. There is some monotonicity and so and it depends it's included in either here or here. And let's see it like in the following way. You can classify the spectral bands into two types according to whether it is included two levels below or one level below. And you can see here, Two levels below, one level below, uh, blue and red, or A and B, and in, and this actually works for all cases. So we can we can call our, our all our spectral approximates in red and blue according to to this monotonicity. And now, so let's demonstrate this. Let's go back to the butterfly and demonstrate this property. So again, this is the the butterfly, and we take as alpha again the very frequent. A golden ratio minus one, and now which has continued function expansion one, 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 and let's start cutting it. So the first, like alpha two, is one over two. So when, when alpha is one over two, or one half, you get two spectral bands, the period is two. Here we color them red and blue according to the A and B types. Now we go forward, the next one will be two over three. You get three bands, again, we color them. Three over five, here at alpha equal three over five, you get the bands, five over eight. You can get the feeling also why it's called Fibonacci and so right? And so and, and you get and you see all and then you see all these approximates. And now this is a bit like hard for it, hard to see. So let's zoom in just to see that how they you can see here kind of the limiting, the limiting thing, and also the red and the blue uh, give you the monotonicity. And if you zoom in even more, you get this picture. So just to demonstrate how it sits on the butterfly. Now let's go on. So, so this is the picture. These are few, few levels. And now what I want to do is to encode them into a graph. I told you that there's going to be a graph behind it. How do I encode them? So every spectral band that is uh, A or B, I put as a vertex that I write here, A or B. And then whenever a spectral band is included in another spectral band, I draw an edge. So this H means that this A is included in this A. Or sometimes I see this B is included in this A, so I draw kind of a edge of length two or two edges from this B to this A. So I encode it as a graph. You can see this, so I encode it. Okay. Now let's delete, uh, let's delete the middle part. And now you can see, I told you that every spectral band is, in, is included in one level below, two levels below, but you can also look on the picture in the other direction. If you look on the vertex A, you can see what, what is going to happen next. If you look on the vertex B, you can see what's going to happen next. And you see always that if you uh, for a certain vertex, like next, on the next level, you will have only A's coming out of it, and two levels above, you will get only B's. And they are ordered very nicely these A and B's here and here. And you see that the B has a bit more A's and B's than the A. So kind of you can use this rule, one can prove it actually, in order to build up your graph from the A's and the B's. So, so let's demonstrate, let's see how it is being done. Uh, let's see how it is being done. So I put here this picture of these fans of, of A and B, and now let's build the graph. So I choose, a particular uh, a sequence for the for the alpha, so 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 4. And now when I have an A, I somehow I know how it how to progress. When I have a B, I know how to progress, and so on and so forth. But there is some delicate thing that how to progress also depends on the next digit of the expansion. 
So for example, when I see when I see this B, and then I know that the next digit is A, then out of this B, I get this kind of structure. And you see that out of this B, you have two A's and three B's, right? But, but when I see a B here, and the next digit is four, then the fan kind of is bigger, because the form tells you that you have more. But the, the bottom line is that, that, that you need to take from it that, that we have a way, a complete way of building this tree graph, knowing the digits of so The digits of R, each, each alpha will bring you a different tree graph. And if the digit is R larger, you have more branching in the tree. Okay. So that's, that's the tree. And now let's, uh, so it's again, this is kind of the tree, and let's build it uh, infinitely. Why, why do we build it infinitely? Because at infinity, the limit at infinity is the spectrum that we really want for the rational alpha. And actually, in order to get to infinity, you take an infinite path from the graph, and, and this infinite path corresponds to a point in the spectrum in the infinite, in the, of the irrational alpha. So let's, let's write it exactly. This is again the thing that you have shown you before, this limit that gives you the, the spectrum of the irrational operator. And if we take an infinite path gamma, so the boundary of the tree is just a set of infinite paths. So any infinite path gamma can be mapped to a point in the spectrum how you take gamma at every level k. So at every level k, you have a spectral band. And if you take the infinite intersection of these spectral bands, you get the point in your spectrum. So this, you can use it to define a map from the boundary of the tree to your spectrum. And then this map can be shown to be subject. So you get some control of, of your spectrum by, by using this force, by using this map. You can, you can think about the spectrum as the boundary of the infinite. Question. I should probably remember the answer. No, no, so, so some of the slides you haven't seen, but now I have a bit more time, so I'm going to more details. Sure. sure. Uh, yeah. That EV is is subjective or really bijective? Ooh. I mean, so you do remember something. So, so, so the, I mean, no, I mean, you, you do remember something, something yeah. and it's very crucial. James, James' question is very crucial. So, so EV, it's relatively easy to show that EV is subjective. Whether it's injective or not is very crucial in our analysis. So I will, with your permission, I will not answer immediately, but in a few slides, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And maybe just to know. Uh, I guess I'm just worried you'd have read me. Yeah, that's another, that's always a good guess uh, in the talk. Uh, but how, uh, maybe I should ask now how many times that will affect the Somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes. Okay. It's very good. Okay. Uh, right, so this EV is subjective, maybe injective. Uh, now, we want to connect it to the integrated density of states. Recall, this is, the, this is the definition of the integrated density of states. So how many eigenvalues do we have to the left of some energy for the finite matrices? And now I will just tell you in words what do I, what, what do I mean by it, by it. So when I go along the path, when I choose a certain energy, it corresponds to a certain infinite path. Every point on this path corresponds to a finite, uh, to, to a periodic operator, which means a finite matrix. So counting how many eigenvalues I have to, I have smaller than this energy, is just counting how many points here on the graph I have to the left, mm -hmm. and divide by the size of the matrix. So I, how many points here I have to the left, divided by that. How many points here I have to the left, divided by the top. So I can really see this value of the IDS from the path on the graph in this way. Uh, so how many vertices to the left of gamma at a certain level k, divided by qk. So qk is this denominator uh, which gives you the number of, uh, of vertices on this level. And what is interesting is that this right-hand side doesn't depend on V, on the potential, because in the graph there is no dependence on the, the potential, which is a nice property and, and helpful. Okay? So this is the IDS, but now we remember we need the IDS not for a particular energy, but for spectral gap. And what is a spectral gap? A spectral gap 
is given by two energies, is bounded by two energies. Now, two energies means two infinite paths. So we need to look for two infinite paths that reach some energies such that in between these paths, there is nothing. There is no spectrum. So what do I do? I go, I have some common trajectory, and then at some point I decide, stop. Now I go right. And after that, I go left, 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 left in the garden. And in the other trajectory, now I go left, and then I go right, 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 right in the ground. And that, that's how I find two trajectories that hit two energy points. And in between them, there is a gap. So I just, what do I want to do? I want to evaluate the integral density of states here and here, and to check what do they equal to. And actually, I can find that the IPS is equal to both these paths. Why? So what is the idea? Here I count how many points do I have to the left of this one? Or how many points do I have to the left of this point? What is the difference? One. And one here, and one here. But this one that is a difference is divided by QK that goes to infinity. So in the limit, this value is the same. So really that's why they are equal. And if they are equal, that's it. We found we found that this spec that this is really a spectral gap. It is open. Another ingredient that I will not go into details is to show you is that we managed to for any value of these candidates in alpha module one, we managed to find to construct such two uh, paths that give me that value. Okay, then this is a bit related to the combinatorics of the three, but if you believe me on that. Then that's it. For any candidate, we find such two paths. So for any candidate, we found the gap. You now the question at every branching point, right? Sorry? You have to test it at every branching point. I at every branching point I can I can kind of do it. I can decide, okay, now I split here, I go like that, here I go like that, and then left the right. Yeah, exactly. So now the question is, does it imply if you believe me on this proposition? Does it imply that really I get all candidates? And 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 that the theorem is proven. And to answer this question, this goes back to James' question: Is the map injective? Why? Because if the map is not injective, what might happen? This two path and this two path lead to the same energy, and then of course, IDS is is the same because it's the same energy. So really to show to show that really there is a gap here, I need to show the objectivity of the map. So that's kind of that's a very crucial point. And that is not, not so easy as subjectivity. Okay. Why it is not so easy? Let me now give you some feeling of why it is not so easy. And also I address a bit the question from before about the potential. Yeah, so let's demonstrate why, why injectivity is not easy. Again, the same example, same three. Uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 4. And let's look just on these two levels. We will do a very basic, simple analysis. At 0, the potential is uh, always 0. And then the potential is always 0. Our operator is just adjacency operator. It has one spectral band between minus 2 to 2. <coughs> at, the, at the next level, 0, 1. So 0, 1, the potential is constant 1. What does it mean that the potential is constant one? You multiply by V, and what is the spectrum? Minus two to two plus V. Minus two to two plus V. So you have this spectrum there. I will not do the analysis for the next one, but these ones are enough to show something. Now, let's see what, what we can do. Let's now change the value of V, like you asked for. So let's take the value of V and decrease it. So as we decrease in, what happens when if we decrease the value of V? So as we decrease the value of V, this is going to the left. Okay, and more to the left. And remember, it's not just that this goes to, when this goes to the left, all this part of the T also goes to the left. And now injectivity, uh, not so not so easy that, that all these parts are separate. But that's that's kind of the crucial thing. And and if we go even further, oh. This is catastrophe, like they lie one on top of the other. 
But when catastrophe, when this catastrophe is not zero, when V equals zero, but mm -hmm. V equals zero, we don't care about this, so it's not really catastrophe. So that, that is sanity. But shape. V equals one is already sort of halfway over life. And okay, well, since you are, you are really asking, you're asking me, <laughs> when did this happen? When did V equals V equals what? Four. V equals four. So at V equals four, because if you remember four. this four from before, yeah. You start getting problems with the conductivity. So this is really the point. So when V is larger than four, you have a lot of separation between the bands, and that's what makes kind of easier for conductivity. When V is smaller than four, you mean you need to struggle a bit more. Okay. And I'm not sure. Okay, so now the next few slides show you a, a bit of our struggle. A bit more when V goes smaller than four. I'm just wonder whether to to go into that or not. Maybe let's do it more relaxed. I'm not going to details and later, later if you want to talk about it. So just to give to give an easier angle of the of the talk. So uh, right. So so when just say when V greater than four, this is the really good work of, of Raymond from '95. So for V greater than four, if you have two spectral bands, IJ, which do not belong to the same path, so say one is here and one is here, then their, their intersection is the empty set and you have no problem with inductivity. You know that the two paths are separate. So, so this you can show when V greater than four. And when V smaller than four, you know that this doesn't happen and you need to use further tools. Uh, right, so this lemma of Raymond is used to prove this A and B type, to construct the tree, to show injectivity, but, uh, and, and then to get the theorem. Uh, but when V is smaller than four, uh, we need to use something else. I will not go into the details of that to be a bit more relaxed, but uh, uh, we are doing some alternative lemma, we have some corollary. Uh, and then just to, yeah, okay, there are, there are, there are quite a few, like, Technical tools. I want to give you the kind of the light uh, picture. There are some technical tools which I specify here. If you're interested, I can go a bit into more details. Uh, but then I hope I gave you the big picture of like the spirit behind uh, behind this, this uh, theorem. Not all gaps are there, and kind of with that, I will uh, thank you for, for your attention, for being here, for being uh, there. And again, thanks for the uh, making invitation.